people who do not know anything about this whole area, they sooner or later ask, are you on anything now? They think that we go around on psychedelic drugs Turn all the time. Turn on all the time. <laughs> uh, mushrooms, psilocybin. I um, hold 2CB as being a very... 2CB. Very excellent uh, psychedelic. Um, uh, uh, mescaline. Mescaline. I don't like drugs that get too, too sparkly. I like the MDA world. Yeah, I, I don't like stoning drugs. Mm -hmm. I don't like being stoned. It's, uh, you don't learn anything. Um, I don't like drugs that inhibit communication. Like, for instance, what? 2CE. I mean, um, right, um, MDE. Oh, okay. I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I could do without MDE. Uh, 2CI is good. 2CI is very good. The sexual aspects are always very, very uh, positive contributors if to liking. If we can't, uh, can't make love on, on a drug, then there's something not quite right. Fire in here. We got ethyl ether in here. Oh, oh so everyone out of here. here. All we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out what you're doing there and if what you're doing is illegal. In 1966, Shulgin quit his job as a chemist for Dow Chemical to devote himself entirely to the study of psychoactive drugs, drugs that alter the mind. The stepfather of Rabe's favorite pharmaceutical lives in the hills behind San Francisco. In the mid-1960s, he resynthesized an obscure drug that had been patented but then ignored. It was called 3,4-methylene-dioxy-N-methylamphetamine, MDMA for short. It would later acquire the street name Ecstasy. Just as LSD, marijuana, and Woodstock unite a generation, Ecstasy and the rave scene act as a glue for millions of savvy middle-class kids seeking an escape. From Bangkok to Bournemouth, Manchester to Miami. If there was one place on earth where it all began, then it's right here in California, in the small home laboratory of a man he's known as the godfather of ecstasy. No other drug has ever spread so fast. 25 milligrams, no effect. 40, no effect. 60 milligrams, no effect. 81 milligrams, is a, I got a plus one. Uh, 53 minutes smooth shift into a light intoxication, distinct, almost early alcohol-like intoxication. I first met him and Sasha many years ago. I thought about how I would introduce him, and everything I, I thought about saying, I got so emotional, I started crying. Hello. This is kind of a personal question. Is there anything that, say, does to the brain what MDMA does to the heart? <laughs> Alexander Sasha Shulgin, PhD, is a pharmacologist, chemist, and drug developer. 2CT7, 2CI, and 2CB are the most well-known. Shulgin personally tested hundreds of drugs. New York Times Magazine. It's an article on Dr. E for ecstasy. There's no reason that I should be ecstasy, Dr. Ecstasy. Ecstasy is not the name I gave anything. I called it MDMA. And uh, it's just a, it's an element of notoriety that does no good. He didn't even invent it. In his discoveries and his own inventions, he encountered this drug that somebody else had made. It didn't exist in nature until chemists working for the German pharmaceutical company Merck, synthesized it by accident in their laboratories in 1912. No use for the new molecule was discovered, and MDMA remained little more than a formula on faded paper for more than 60 years. So somebody made it, but didn't realize its potential. <laughs> This is World War I. With Germany's defeat, MDMA and every other patented drug is turned over to the Allies as a spoil of war. Its existence is lost from memory, 
until the Cold War compels the Pentagon to re-examine its potential for national defense. The love drug does nothing of use for war, but the compound still exists. It sat on a shelf, but he thought, hmm, they never really took it orally. I wonder if it's active. Let's try it at the 50 milligram dose. Let's try it at the 100 milligram dose. Oh, there's something going on here. Wow, whoa, this has a altered state experience. Dr. Shulgin made these careful notes, the first recorded experience on ecstasy. Actually, the first, first trial in that particular guise was on a, a train trip. He published a paper on it, described its effects, and uh, several of his friends are psychiatrists, and uh, they decided to try it. They tried it on themselves first. In the psychotherapeutic community, MDMA is called empathy. Its effect is likened to a year of therapy in six hours. Once a psychiatrist started using it, uh, phew, man, it was, it was in demand. We've got another drug. It is synthetic, and it makes you love everybody. I was diagnosed to have terminal cancer a few months ago, and naturally there's a lot of fear and anger and pain, emotional pain that surrounds something like sure that. Is. It has allowed me to open up and have communication with my family that I have never been able to have before. <laughs> it's called it's called ecstasy. Now who doesn't want to take ecstasy? The whole concept of the MDMA going into ecstasy, uh, really originally the empathy, but not what empathy was. So they called it E for ecstasy. It is a popularization and in essence destroyed the uh, the uh, medical value effectively of the of the material. Had MDMA not strayed from that community, it might have remained legal. But beyond the therapist's office, it becomes wildly popular. And that is the beginning of the end for the legal use of ecstasy. This morning, the Drug Enforcement Administration is announcing its intention to place the drug known as MDMA, or by the street name, ecstasy, under emergency controls in Schedule 1. This, this whole thing is, is pitched as a, a self-development type of experience. Uh, get in touch with nature, get in touch with the universe, get in touch with your mother. They said half a hit of E would be fun. Everywhere you look, it's there, including service members. I mean, it's everywhere. Ecstasy film vi prikazuje. You just don't know who's making it. Finish with that light yellow white. And now the term now applies to anything and everything that's used at a rave. It doesn't, it doesn't have to have any MDMA in it at all. Just the term is used as a, as a, a, a party escape drug. And I'm sad to say I, I'm, not, I, I'm not happy with it. <laughs> To Dr. Shulgin, it was just one of hundreds of mind-altering drugs he concocted. In books and papers, he has published the formulas and the effects of each. His critics argue that Shulgin is simply providing a roadmap for drug abuse. <laughs> I didn't want my life to be a carbon of his own. But the number one reason I knew he was a brilliant scientist. Iron with five and 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 five and
I would never even compete within that world that I didn't want to be compared against. Stacking in the middle, you know, turn it all the way along. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. It's a good one. Don't use that. See, my dad was very hip. During the 60s and the 70s, he was the beatnik. And I was the rebel, tight and close and not involved in, in that world. I, I just, I didn't want anything to do with his world. And I can see an orange, a larger orb of light inside of his head. And where our heads were connecting was a flash of light that shot out straight ahead and we could see it. Basically, I see psychedelics as, as uh, spiritual tools. And we brought more cookies. More cookies. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> they're, they're straight, right? Yes, yes, absolutely, just like us which is not quite the way Sasha sees them. And it produces this cascade of inflammatory changes. Ooh. They are very good tools uh, for anyone who's on any kind of spiritual journey, whatever that means, and it means different things to different people. <laughs> and uh, uh, psychotherapy can be uh, a part of that. I mean, people who go into psychotherapy are on a spiritual quest whether they call it that or not. How do you define consciousness and how much of it is determined by chemistry? Well, that's not a question. Uh, I consider consciousness where you are if you're alive. And a lot of people put it as a brain function. I consider consciousness as a mental function. He's outside the mainstream. I mean, he is kind of a, a rogue. Uh, he's not part of an official establishment. Uh, he's doing things that are sort of socially frowned upon by the majority of, of our societies. Oh, it's ducked down in case a bird flies out. Oh, my golly. That's where that compound went. <laughs> Usually you have wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, clean benches, and all the bottles on the shelf lined up in alphabetical order. That's a display in a, in a moving picture laboratory or a government laboratory. Uh, a real productive laboratory is, in essence, a personal mess. And as you have things at hand, you remember what it was, drop it down, get it back up again. Oh, that's not ready to work up yet. Well, Sasha's passionately committed to, to understanding how these drugs work. And, uh, what, and, and their structure activity. He's mainly a chemist. I know I tried running a reaction with quite a bit of heat in a matter of an hour or two and it, almost no reaction at all. So I put it over a little a magnetic stirrer that throws off a small, out of, small amount of heat and it's just slightly warm, uh, maybe 30 degrees. And it's been that now for uh, a couple of months. And so his real fascination again is to make, the, to make chemicals with very small differences and to test to test the, the you know to test that to test what those differences are, and um, you know he's been willing to test them on himself for the longest time period. He's been the principal subject, and all this mess around here, except those things that drop down thanks to squirrels and and other rodents and birds. Birds come down the fireplace periodically. His fundamental driving force is is to understand how how these compounds work and and what their differences are rather than just to get loaded. Sure collect a lot of stuff. My God, I was looking the other day, I said, where did I get all this stuff? But I use it all one time or another. Of all things, this is to imitate a... Uh, egg-sucking leech, if you can believe that. Oh, I was gung-ho for working for the government and uh, doing some good. You know, in 1969, I transferred to what at that time was Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs and uh, took over as the director of the crime lab in San Francisco. That was my grandfather's weapon, the uh, old muzzle loader, and it was very heartwarming. Um, to meet the agents, uh, the other chemists, it was um, it was like a family, and they knew that if you had a problem, they would help you. 
You see my Kirk collection? I'm working on it. <laughs> I noticed one of the um, uh, Pachinois was in bloom a couple, three, four days ago, but I think it's pretty well gone now. Pruvianus. Uh, Tractocerus macrogonus. Just about every country and every culture on Earth has uh, at least one visionary plant um, uh, that they, they use, or that some of them use, uh, for uh, altering consciousness. Well, the cactus... Here, on how many varieties do you think there are, Ted? In, in here? In, no, in the in the overall, maybe oh, 50? Yeah, probably. Perhaps 50 varieties of cactus. And they're all chosen because they're all psychoactive. I mean, we have receptors for psychedelic drugs. We do not have natural psychedelic drugs inside of us. Why do we have the receptors and not the drugs? Well, perhaps at one time we had the drugs. As part of a metabolic process, we generated the drugs that made the psychedelic state a, a, a natural state. And these people then would, uh, I can see the potential of, of looking at, a, at, a, at the tooth of a saber-toothed tiger and saying, oh, look at the pretty designs on this tooth. And as a consequence of dropping your defenses against an enemy, be removed from the gene pool. So perhaps those people who did turn on because of endogenous psychedelics were removed from the gene pool, and therefore they're no longer there. The, the drugs are not uh, made in the body, but the receptors are still there because the receptors were not the hazard. It was a drug that was generated that was the hazard to survival. And so that is maybe why some of these plants with their psychedelic components turn you on because the receptors are intact from generations, but the natural psychedelic metabolite in the body no longer exists. Is it a path you should avoid or a path you should go down? I don't know how you can answer the question until you start down the path. <laughs> I, I really don't. <laughs> if we could get two seats over here and a little bit more in the shade, I would really love that. I would feel much better about everything. To Dwayne, D-U-A-N-E. Oh, I see. It's been, I think, a little bit embarrassing, especially to my children, that uh, I had written quite a lot about... Uh, um, making love under the influence of, of psychedelics. So you've been in this a long time, and I'm wondering if there's you know, information or... These books have been an exploration, not just of the effects of drugs, but of the effects of these particular drugs on us. Maybe, out to you. Chemical structure, outline of synthesis, biochemistry, pharmacology, legal status, What I saw a lot in the uh, work I did, like in doing uh, raids on clandestine laboratories, you have that a whole class of people that know nothing about what they're doing, but they read things on how to make a drug, and they screw it up. And I mean, they cause a lot of damage, not just to themselves, but to their families, uh, to the surrounding area, to the environment. Uh, we really had some dummies, oh man, I mean, total idiots, trying to cook drugs, it's just, it's what made it so dangerous to go in one of those labs, because you never knew what they were doing, because they didn't know what they were doing. Two methoxy, methoxy, oxygen, oxygen, and a bromine down here, bond to a carbon, bond to another carbon, and then back into the ring. You have a five-membered ring, you're a chemist, and this, therefore your benzene ring has two rings alongside it, on either side, hence the idea of fly. It's as if there were wings. In some areas, you don't want to teach a teenager how to make a bomb, you just don't. You have to synthesize it yourself. I don't, I, I don't think it's ever, ever been commercially available.
Yeah, it was a good agency. Uh, and they were all dedicated. They believed in what they were doing. But it changed. Sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. It will rain sometime tonight. When I was in high school, my father was never speaking on the telephone. He wanted to be in person in private, he always thought that the phones might be tapped. And I never questioned that they might be tapped, it's just that I couldn't think of why they were wishing to persecute my father. Mr. Cameraman? This is, a, this is a safety issue. Now you can take your this, pictures, but no you're going to do it out of the area. The trouble started only when the first book had been published. They said, holy mackerel, or something to that effect. Uh, this guy has a DEA license. Sasha was uh, on very good terms with a lot of the chemists in the DEA because chemists love chemistry. And he was this, this maverick chemist. He had a DEA license to do lab work. And, uh, you know, this is a respectable man and a respectable scientist. Uh, so you don't just barge in. Did my wife invite you? We were here for the call. We'll discuss let's, let's all that. Let's move out of here. I we're we're going to walk up the road I'm to the phone. If you try to resist it, the lawful detention will be an arrest. One of them asked, you don't by any chance have any peyote uh, here, do you? And he said, yeah, right, right, right there next to your feet. And they just jumped. They, they, it, 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 suddenly you realize that these people were really scared of these things. It's just a little damn cactus. All we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out what you're doing there and if what you're doing is illegal. They didn't understand psychedelics. They had the image of somebody out of control, somebody who didn't belong in decent society. The whole process of drug enforcement I found it to be a huge game with them. I realized that my father was active bait for these people. The powers not delegated to the United States by the uh, Constitution. Even though he didn't commit any crime, there was never a charge filed, but they could they could hound him, and I, 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 I understand his frustration. Or to the people. That's it. And there's no mention in the Constitution of drugs anywhere. I mean, I. I
So is there a dark side to what Sasha did? Certainly. Lots of people have used a number of these compounds and hurt themselves significantly because of it. So there is, yeah, there is a dark side to, to discovering this kind of information. But I certainly wouldn't argue that it shouldn't be done. Sasha's interest has been ex exploring the, you know, the nature and the limits of the human condition through tweaking some of these um, molecules to produce, you know, different and interesting kinds of effects. And that's really at its heart what the clinical pharmacology is is about. I mean, we're we're studying the nature of uh, the the human organism. Well, a lot of people think I created much, much grief and much sadness and naughty, naughty, naughty. It was my first experience with mescaline, which is a psychoactive drug that's found in the peyote cactus and in many other cacti. And I had an experience with it, gosh, what that, 45, 50 years ago. I saw colors that uh, uh, I, I was totally uh, unfamiliar with. A flower it had a color that I couldn't even give a name to. I, I had to recall memories of childhood. I was seeing with, with articulate clarity. And then I thought, why would 400 milligrams of a white crystal have all of this in it? What it's doing is allowing me to communicate with parts of me that I had not communicated with for a long time. Pretty sure he was 15 when he enrolled in Harvard. I think he only went maybe uh, three semesters, something like that. and. Uh, Emotionally, it was very difficult for him because of his age compared to the uh, the age of the other people in the university, plus the difference in background. I was curious in the Navy, I studied chemistry when I was in the Navy, I had a, a big textbook that I carried around for three years in the Atlantic, and I memorized it in the process. This was kind of a neat uh, challenge. But I came out and went into chemistry uh, in the university, and then I took my doctorate work in biochemistry. So I wanted to have access to exploring and interpreting the exploration of these things. I did not know where I was going to go, but I went into uh, industrial chemistry, and there I really caught the, the, the good luck of having predicted the structure of something that would go commercial, and was given total license. Evidently, he had been one of the most productive chemists in the Dow Chemical organization and had developed a series of insecticides that were making many millions of dollars for the chemistry division of the corporation. And they let him just do whatever he felt like. That bridge could be the gateway to a whole world of Californian charms and surprises. When I was an intern in San Francisco, 1962 to 1963. I just loved drugs. I was always interested in how drugs act. And I wanted to be a psychiatrist, so I was particularly fascinated by drugs and the brain. The most crooked street in the world is a curiosity. And every Sunday, my wife and I and our friends would get together and do, quote, experiments. That was the ceremonies in which President Bush conveyed the National Medal of Science. So I was already fascinated by the psychedelic drugs. And when I was asked to evaluate 
a program involving drugs of that sort at the Dow Chemical Company, I leapt at the opportunity. When I arrived there, I learned all about what had been going on with Sasha. Oh, good. From that point on, uh, my, all my chemical uh, thought process, all my plans, all my structural uh, synthetic uh, designs were in the area of taking the simple little molecule, messed with three methoxy groups and a little chain and a nitrogen, and modifying this atom, modifying that atom, change this atom to that atom, change this, make it longer, make this shorter, add something else out here, remove that. Where around this entire thing can I make all these changes one at a time and see where, uh, what is it in this molecule that lets it fit into the receptor site that causes the psychedelic action? He argued to his superiors that this could be therapeutically important at doses at which there was no risk of psychotic effects. And their attitude was, if anything comes in value, we'll, we'll exploit it and patent it. And a lot, some of them were patented. Sasha's work took this to a level of serious corporate interest. Even though this was the time of the Haight-Ashbury district in San Francisco with publicity all over the United States about the hippies taking LSD and other psychedelic drugs and how irresponsible it was. Very, very controversial. For some, the lifestyle of the late 60s was bohemian. Dropouts from the corporate culture joined communes on campuses, in cities, and on farms. I was never part of the Haight-Ashbury scene. I was uh, interested in seeing where it was going, and I would like to get what information I could get from it as to what drugs are being used. And I had made a couple of allies in the Haight-Ashbury to get little samples of, of materials, and from this I was able to identify them. But some were things I had made and published, some were just totally uh, from other, other sources. They may uh, obtain valid insights. So often, though, all too often, they do not. And in a turned on or euphoric state, step or attempt to fly from cliffs and high windows with real life, permanent, non-psychedelic results. Other trippers attempt to merge their beings with large, fast automobiles. <laughs> The government was very, very scared of abuse of psychedelic drugs, and there would be corporate risks of having the Dow respected name associated with something that people could criticize. And because of that, ultimately, the board of directors of Dow decided not to go forward with this drug development. Now, no longer at Dow, but I have my laboratory set up at home and I continued making compounds of new materials. What would have happened if Dow administration had said, let's go forward? It's quite possible that the careful use of the appropriate drugs might well uh, have been a big advance in psychiatry. Yeah. Yes, oh, okay. It's our stairway to heaven. <laughs> this black stuff in here is platinum. This is full of hydrogen, just like the Hindenburg. This is actually a baby psychedelic in here. <laughs> from NIDA. Maybe it's something about money. That's what I need. I need good news about money. Oh, I know what this is. Yeah. This is a dopamine D3 antagonist that uh, we're using to figure out what LSD is doing in the brain. I'll open this one. My hands are ah, stronger. I'm working in the system. Doing it the way they say you have to do it. 
you know, we have all kinds of uh, OSHA rules and EPA rules and all the radioisotopes have to be taken care of. And that's always, you know, been my shtick is if you want to make change happen, you work inside the system. Have you seen Sasha's live? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, what more can I say? Um, Different than Sasha's. Yeah. I mean, his is really more of an alchemist hangout, if anything, you know, sort of. Uh, it was the almost simultaneous discovery of serotonin's occurrence in the brain and the discovery by Albert Hoffman of LSD that really made people look at the role of serotonin in behavioral states. Because in the 1940s, psychiatry didn't really believe in neurochemistry. They thought it was all bad mothering, you know, your mother wasn't nurturing, whatever. They had no idea that neurochemicals could affect the way that we feel. So the discovery of LSD in 1943 and then the discovery of serotonin in 48 and then its discovery in the brain in the early 50s, people put two and two together and said, you know, LSD has this powerful behavioral effect and it's got a piece of serotonin embedded in it and serotonin's in the brain so maybe serotonin has some effect on mood regulation. Of course now we know it affects almost everything. Um, mood, appetite, hunger, sex, consciousness, you name it. Stuart, yes. this is the guy who's, this is the guy who made the mescal, or the psilocybin. He's the, he's the real culprit here. <laughs> There's probably not that many labs in the United States where um, um, PCAL is a desk reference. And, and usually, and probably not where it's a desk reference where the spine is broken from being opened up so much. <laughs> the, uh, but the, well, there's actually, you know, um, for, in, as far as the synthesis of um, phenethylamines are concerned, there's, you know, a lot of good work in there, too, you know. So when you need a quick, you know, uh, uh, a quick um, tickle to, you know, well, how are we going to make this phenethylamine or this nitrostyrene or something? You can look in there and see, you know, uh, what he did. So uh, <laughs> this is probably going to be a little jarring because we have sort of a mix of uh, 1970s technology and more current stuff going on, but <laughs> there'll be a lot of flashing lights and wires. This room here is, is where we do um, are more sort of long-term studies. With Dr. Shulgin, you know, he made a pretty strong case for sort of self-experimentation. And, you know, he talked about the fact that if you want to know what these drugs are like, you need to try them. And, you know, he said that answers the question. And in his books, you, you see that a lot. And it answers some questions. It doesn't answer my questions. So this is one of the good ones that dissolves without much trouble. You know, I think there are certain things that you can really only do in animal models right now, where we can sort of study the mechanism of action of these drugs. We put the animals into these boxes here. Um, so, you know, the whole cage fits right in. This guy's got one of those probes right now. Um, so we could throw him in there and fire it up and see what his temperature is if we wanted to. So what that animal is saying is that as we increase the dose and get to active doses of this test drug, it is MDMA-like to them. The animal's trained to sort of, you know, put its head through there. Instead of pushing a lever, they use their head to break a photo beam, and that's what counts as the response. Working with animals really helps to sort of peel away some of the sort of mystical veneer that has been put onto these drugs throughout the past. You're making a material that's never been, uh, never been uh, looked at before. It, no one's ever made it. And so you wonder, is it, is it a psychedelic? You don't know. Uh, you can't go to the literature because it's not in the literature. It's a brand new thing. It meets you and you meet it. You begin learning from it and it learns from you. 
you can find the basic emotions in animals, but you don't find the subtleties of the mental process. And that's why you must use human subjects and why you must be really careful because sometimes you bend something and it doesn't unbend. What happens is it's like hair on your neck stands up a little bit. Ooh, something's going on. There's that little aura of, of beginning effect. Once I have found what I believe is the active level, then Anne joins me in an experiment to confirm that it's not me that's strange, but it's the compound it has the same action on both of us to some extent. And once that has been confirmed, then our research group will meet with the compound, about uh, maybe eight or maybe ten people, and we'll share the compound all around. He is a little bit more sensitive, so often he'll take a little bit less. He's a little bit in the refractory, maybe a little bit more. And we'll get a, we'll get a feel of the whole group, and the group all confirms the activity. You've answered the question. What you have is um, part of the self-preservation is to ignore 95% of the stuff that's out there. You have a person who's observing everything and remembers everything. He can't cross the street because he's fascinated by the green lights, by the cars, by the gravel, by the flies that are over there on the thing, by the fact that a car has a little blinker going. And if he pays attention to everything he saw, he'd be at life's risk to go across a crosswalk, crossing a street. So he learned to turn that off, turn that off, turn that off. Watch for the green light, watch where the first step foot goes down there, glance right and left, there's no car coming, and you get across the street safely. You have to ignore 99% of what's around you to be safe, to achieve what you want to achieve. What these things catalyze, letting you get access to those things you've been ignoring or have been denying. Albert Hoffman was a Swiss chemist. Swiss and German chemists were known for the precision and meticulous techniques. So he first made LSD in 1938 and sent it to the pharmacology department. They said, it's not interesting. And then he comes back in 1943 and he has this really strong impression, this sort of intuition that they must have screwed up something. I gotta make that drug again. So then he gets some somehow in his body. So we have a plum tree, a sour cherry tree, peach tree, Asian pear, and an apple tree over there. Now how does a meticulous Swiss chemist get that in his body? He can't tell you how it got in his body. So let me offer an alternate hypothesis. First of all, we know he had uh, mystical experiences when he was a child. He talks about it. He was walking out in the field one day and he had this mystical experience. So, so let me suggest that he had a propensity to have a mystical experience. I shouldn't even let you see this. I'm so, I've done such a bad job this year. It just hasn't been watered. I haven't thinned it. I haven't taken the weeds out. I offered that hypothesis. In fact, I told Albert, I said, you know, I don't think you actually ingested any that first time. I think it was, you had some kind of spontaneous experience. And that spontaneous experience was related to the fact that you had this strong intuition that you should, you should go back and make more of it. I've always had, a, always had a garden and grown something. So it's sort of a cosmic conspiracy, like, and as a scientist, I'm not allowed to say things like that. So here's some blackberries. So you think you know how the mind works. It just there's a lot to be found. And you have to find out by influencing, changing, disturbing. I love the use of radioactive materials because you can scan yourself and find out where it goes in the brain. And, and that is where the, where's the mind? Where would you say the mind is? In the brain? In the spirit? In the gallbladder? Where's the mind in the body? When all these things, oh, mind, you mean the brain? No, no, the mind. I mean, where's the soul? Is it in you or around you? Where is it located? What does it look like? Is it rectangular? Is it round? You know, I think the idea of uh, a soul 
whatever it is, uh, whatever different people from all over the world think it is, it seems to me the commonality is that it's something that continues after you're dead. And to me, that's crazy. I mean, I, I don't understand how anybody could truly believe that. Um, when you're dead, you're dead. I um, used to get really upset about it. I used to, you know, tell him, like, I've lost too many okay. people that I love to not believe okay, that there's a heaven I got more. or else that I'm just thinking they're, they're rotting away, you know? So, and he would just be like, well, that's what happens, you know? We'll I would agree to and blah, 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 and I'm just going to freeze my head, and I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah. uh, what, you know, but, you know. She really doesn't like the idea of freezing my head at the moment of death so that I can get it grafted onto a cloned body when they can cure whatever it was that killed me. No, because then he's going to be here without me. Yeah, banging some new future chicks. <laughs> exactly. That aren't you. Exactly. <laughs> right. And I'm a very jealous person. It's to death, till death do us part, right? I'm out once you're dead. <laughs> right. Cut it out, Bill. All right. I think the brain is what most people mean when they say the mind. I think the brain uh, is what most people mean when they talk about their personality, who they are, uh, you know, what they believe, how they feel, things like that. And that stuff's controlled by your brain. It's controlled by brain chemistry. Uh, that's why the drugs that we give to treat people that are having emotional problems, um, you know, problems uh, with anxiety, depression, uh, aggression, you know, on and on, the drugs that we give them, they don't work by affecting your heart. You know, they don't work by affecting your spleen or your, you know, your liver or your gut or your lungs. They go into the brain and they change brain chemistry. And when you change brain chemistry, you change psychology. I was uh, curious to know about the effects of these drugs that hadn't been studied very carefully clinically for 35 years and we decided wouldn't it be interesting to undertake a study with a classical hallucinogen that are alleged to model primary mystical experiences. Psilocybin is from the mushroom which has been used sacramentally uh, for thousands of years. Hello. Hi, Roland Griffith. Okay. You can tell them that you're working in a research pharmacy. They see Rite Aid or something. They have no clue. Now if I said this mushroom, they, they you know. But, <laughs> but I don't think they'd know what psilocybin is. And I can't say that I held up much hope that psilocybin would necessarily be a very good model. I mean, it almost sounds ludicrous, you know, and, and what percentage of God did you experience? <laughs> People typically would go, well, you know, when my firstborn, you know, was delivered, that changed me forever. I'll never forget that moment. And my father recently passed away, and that was deeply moving. And so, you know, it, it's kind of like that. <laughs> Kind of like that. So it, it, was, it, it was an experience of that order of magnitude. I had no idea. Instead of either or, either or, it's both and, both and, both and. This is eight hours laying on a couch here at Johns Hopkins. I died, but I've never been more alive. There's something at, at its core that has to do with the core of ethical and moral behavior about the sense of interconnectedness of all people and things. At its heart, we're talking about altruism in its purest sense. We're talking about love and caretaking for other people and for the environment. And we have the opportunity to study that. I can't imagine anything more important than that. Sitting beside someone who is, whose consciousness is entering into these profound realms, uh, well, it's at the extreme, it's almost like you're uh, like sitting beside the Buddha under the bow tree as enlightenment is happening.
participation mystique. You, you become aware of yourself as, as a, a glowing thread in, in a tapestry. And all those, you know, cliches. Um, but they, the cliches are based on real experience and real feeling, and real sensations. And they don't mean anything unless you, uh, un unless they have um, an influence on what you do with your life. Children live in the world that, that uh, we revisit with psychedelics. Almost invariably, the first uh, experience with a psychedelic, person will come out of it saying, oh, it was all so familiar. To advance spiritually, you have to encounter your monster. Your, your shadow. The shadow is created by our parents and by our society, our neighborhood. Out of those things which we learn as children, we cannot do. We can't grab a, a toy from the other child just because we want the toy. Um, we can't um, uh, kill the baby sister just because, you know, we resent the fact that she's taken over the household. There are certain things, uh, impulses, that have to be controlled. But they don't disappear from the psyche. They, they become uh, repressed. And all of us have that. If we're socialized, uh, if we're able to live in, in society, all, uh, we have a shadow side. Well, when you have four children, somewhere along the line, you learn how to cut you don't want them uh, cutting them when they're very small. As a lay therapist, I spent about a year and a half, almost two years with patients doing work on the shadow. That part of yourself that you are ashamed of and that you also believe you cannot live with. With a good psychedelic tool, we have the patient step into the body of the monster and turn around and look out its eyes. At which point there is no fear, there is immense strength, and looking out the eyes of your own monster, you begin to make friends with it. it it never becomes entirely civilized, but it can become your ally. I was in a depressed state and I lost my balance. So I was seeing a psychiatrist and at the time MDMA had not been controlled and it was not even a prescription drug, but it was available and uh, uh, she pres prescribed it to me and uh, man, it, it, it totally changed my life. Uh, it's called uh, by the psychiatrist that uses it, an empathogen. It gives you uh, empathy for yourself. I relived a thing that I, I'm surprised I wiped this out. I was in the first grade in grade school, and the, we were in an old, old building, and it had the big, high plaster ceilings, they were 12 feet high, and the ceiling collapsed, and the plaster fell on this kid that was right in front of me, hit him on the head, and busted it all open, and then collapsed my desk right down on my legs. And here he has his head back bleeding on me, and I'm trapped under here, all the other kids 
screamed and they run out of the room and I'm trapped. And uh, boy, that's, oh, what a feeling. Then I had, uh, strangely enough, survivor guilt. But anyway, after those two episodes, got rid of that trapped feeling. So that was a big benefit to me. Last year, my father was dealing with uh, like suicidal issues and, and talking with him. I found out that he's had it since he was a child. I was able to take the information that you that you talked about and reveal to him things about his shadow to get him to open up. And so it, I credit you in helping to save my father's life. And so I, I want you to know, I like, I, I'm getting goosebumps right now just telling you that, but thank you so much. Between mind and brain, when you die, uh, the brain is becomes non-functional. Do you do you believe that the mind may still be functional in the absence of a brain? Do you think the soul might be functional in the absence of a, a brain? I remember one time I was on an experiment. I forget the chemical; it doesn't matter. But uh, as I was, in fact, you were with me. We were I together. Was. And um, I was looking at the clock, because it was interesting to see the second hand of the clock going around. And as I was watching the second hand of the clock, it was going slower and slower and slower. And uh, we decided how much slower could you get it to go? So we watched the second hand, and we worked together, and we got the second hand to where it's very, very slowly moving. And it, another second occurred. It's now within six seconds of being the bottom of the, down number six down there. And then a little while later, sometime later, another second occurred, but each one was taking longer than the previous second. And it occurred to me, if the clock were to stop, what defines death? And suddenly I realized I had taken a chemical that's causing the clock to slow down continuously. And we both snapped around out of it and the clock went normally again. No, he chickened out. <laughs> if you are approaching death in an asymptotic way, where you're getting closer and closer and closer to time, and you never touch that baseline, you're eternal. Your life is eternal. You're just going at a slower pace. Yeah, Won't you watch this opening? Uh, oh, okay. Safe to go in? Yeah, yeah well, sure. yes. Yeah. yeah, you're going in. That's what you're doing. So you don't have to walk up four floors. Up there. Yes. Have you ever gone down that elevator? No, no. Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> she appropriately severe. Oh, I'm very, very happy to be here. Every new generation automatically wants to, to break the, the bonds created by the older generation. I mean, that's what. It, uh, that's part of their job is to, you know, stretch uh, things and. Uh, Never trust anybody over sixteen. Uh, over sixteen, <laughs> yeah. You don't even know that. Sasha likes to say there is no casual experiment. And when you're dealing with uh, the human psyche, especially the part that's not conscious most of the time, um, you're dealing with life and death uh, sometimes, whether you expect to be or not. <laughs> So all you can do is 
is write down the things you know and uh, the cautions. You know, if you do this this way, you could probably be safe. Always use a babysitter, um, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Any uh, child with uh, uh, any amount of intelligence is going to be curious and, and want to find out what it is that the grown-ups are saying no to. And the children are, they, they see themselves as eternal. Yeah. They, 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 they will never die because they, they are young. They, they, the, the whole life ahead of them goes on forever. It's only when you get up into the, into the uh, 30s you begin realizing maybe it is not eternal. I don't usually do my experiments in the lab. I usually go to my office or the uh, house and where I have um, the, uh, the assurance of someone else there in case there's something is quite amiss. And occasionally you get into a, um, a, 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 a situation with a, with a new material that you don't know where it is. I, I, I have a, a, a classification of minus, plus, minus, plus, two pluses, three pluses to give the relative potency of something. There is one unusual a category that I have only used twice or three times in my life of four pluses. Anything and everything that occurs is at your command. You can look at a cat up on the hill and the cat looks at me and I smile at the cat and the cat runs away. You are controlling that cat. You have control over everything around. Total control of my environment. Total bliss. And it occurred to me after about half an hour of this extraordinary state, what if this thing were not reversible? Could one stay in a state of bliss for the rest of his life? It's really a scary thought, to be able to control everything totally. And I was very happy when it began drifting away and went back to a, just a plain plus three, a super stoned state. But these little things can occur, something of that ilk, that are disturbing because you suddenly realize they may not be reversible. Perhaps you've instituted a change in your mindset or your, or your uh, sensory integrity that is not reversible. This is quite scary. And this has happened a couple of times. Tiny bit of a breeze, but at the moment, not even that much. Lightness, lightness, uh, running my own body, my own show at my own pace. Could I drive a car? No, I couldn't drive a car, but couldn't anyway because I'm blind. <laughs> so that doesn't that doesn't count. But you could play the piano just as no, well as you not, not with the broken strings on it. <laughs> yeah, I told you. Yeah, it does. Well, it it does. starts standing up. It is? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Just a bit. <laughs> No, throw it on some, throw it on the bricks. There you go. <laughs> That's the way. It's 
squirrels will get it first, though. I'm pretty close to a plus tree. Really? Oh, yeah. how lovely. <laughs> Frankly, they're very boring to me. You only get a bloom once in a while. You can't control the bloom. They'll bloom when they're ready to bloom. Cactus, I'm surrounded by them, just as my father is surrounded by them. My father, to my best knowledge, may not even know what I did in my own research. He probably intellectually knew of it and um, was, not, was not concerned, not interested, did not know what it meant. That is my best guess. Never thought of it. <laughs> I don't have any problem in understanding the, the botanical structure. I don't have a problem with the grafting. I don't have anything. But cactus have this thing called spines. And there's nothing I can do to stay away from a spine. But beyond that, I'm, I'm not saying that what I have done is less than or better than. I can only say that it's quite different then. I deal in nuts and bolts, hydraulic adapters, fasteners of all different kinds and structures, things that you can't find at the normal hardware store. Okay, here you go. Which side? That side. <laughs> It's a long time since I played this thing. <laughs> I've been living out here, I was totally in love with it with a German girl, Gisela, and uh, she was married. And it was a very complex relationship because she wanted to move in with me here, but also she's in love with her husband. That's after my wife's death, my late wife's death, and established a relationship with Anne that has evolved into a very firm, very firm partnership. Oh, neat. I'm playing the key of G and it sounds like I'm playing the key of A. That's weird. My ears are going weird. Mm. Uh, uh, maybe it's not your ears, maybe it's the piano. No, the piano, I think it went out of tune, but not a, maybe it would not have shifted that much. I'm going to try to find out if it's my ears or the piano has just shifted the whole note out of tune. We have deep respect for each other. Uh, we don't try and change each other. I, I treasure him as he is, and he treats me exactly the same way. It was right at the passageway. <laughs> I haven't the slightest idea why I put it there. No. We've both learned from unhappy marriages uh, what not to do. And I'm happy to say that after having had three previous marriages, which were not great relationships. So that's good for my children to see, too, because they had an awful lot of failed marriages. But in this case, we both have a very strong uh, a common interest, psychedelic drugs and visionary plants. But, you know, they're, they're not the only way of doing it. Uh, it's just our chosen way. Oh, you want uh, uh, the most famous example of an uh, ordinary, everyday, oiled state? Falling in love. 
Anytime you fall in love, you go into an altered state. There is no question. You can have a complete, absolute psychedelic um, experience by falling in love, mm -hmm. which is kind of nice. Because nobody can legislate against that, though they would if they could. Because falling in love is also potentially very dangerous. Hmm. Maybe, maybe not. I may have to take my chances on that. Because more more murders are being committed over the loss of, of a, a a love relationship than anything else in human experience, right? Yes, right. I don't know if that's done or not. Turn that one off. And there are people who have psychedelic experience from food. And that has its dangers too. <sighs> oh my god, I've got to feel that too. I do not. Well, I'm guessing it's Sasha. Who's Sasha? Well, you just go find, just go ask him. The guy with the white hair, beard. The mind is, I think, the uh, allows you a border touching of the consciousness. Of the, uh, how far out from you is your you, the outer universe? Where does your consciousness extend to? Where does how 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 do we communicate? Uh, by word, by motion, by action. These are things that uh, are, are thought-out processes. This is the, the brain function, the talking, all the sort of operation of the brain. But the concept of an idea, uh, the expression of an emotion, of, of a, of a um, uh, empathy. The, 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 where does the concept of empathy originate? I don't think anyone knows exactly what the, what, what's meant by the term empathy in terms of actual biological relationships with, with, with others. I found this egg and look what is in it. Let's see, let me see. One theory is that like when you have kids, one of the reasons you bond with your children, because you know, children are, are, are completely parasitic. Dad! <laughs> Oops, sorry. You know, they, they eat your food, they sleep in your house, they, you know, I mean, there's, there's no rational reason. I got two wonderful kids. There's no rational reason why anyone would want children, right? I mean, you know, but, but, but once you have them, you'll give them anything. Right? You know, so that's, that's total empathic bonding. <laughs> What's love? You know? What is, what, is, what, what is that? Is there a biology of love? Undoubtedly there is. Every human experience is love. Right? But, uh, you know, uh, is that different than empathy? That area has been underfinanced and understudied. Yeah, you're right. It's getting wet in here.
Now I'm trying to make it a D. As you get older, you tend to get interested in more spirituality, is there life after death, that sort of stuff. I may wind up there one day myself, but you know, the psychedelics have multiple effects, for sure. You could imagine efforts through chemistry that define a new molecule, which is subtly different from the ones we know of, that uh, is now able to give you, for example, an anti-anxiety effect uh, with one of these sorts of drugs without the psychedelic action. What's he feeling, baby girl? We need yeah. new anti-anxiety medications. We need better antidepressants. The antidepressants that we have are terrible. Um, they rarely are as good as placebo when you test them, um, but they're very widely prescribed. There's a load of people on them. They come with all sorts of side effects, sexual side effects, metabolic side effects, leading to weight gain, things like that. Who wouldn't want something better than that? And, you know, that's sort of where I see myself. Do you want to respond to this, or? Uh, it's, it's something to respond to. Yeah, why don't you grind that up? Okay. There are many who are doing what I did in the 50s and 60s today. Yeah, and I have a question here. <laughs> they have their little laboratories. So but in time. the commentary oh, of all the recipes, I left a lot of clues, Six. little Six. clues, Six. ideas. Six. People are picking up on them and they're pursuing them, and that's exactly what I wanted. Are you surprised your work would have such creative influence? He's an artist. I want this to be an encouragement with ideas. I've got a lot more ideas than I have time or energy to, to exploit. No, uh, I'll, I'll probably keep this till next week. Very see. good, no problem. There are a lot of people working around the edge of the law. Today, prospectors still search for gold spent a lot of money, turned a lot of wheels, and put a lot of people in jail, but uh, it did not change the drug scene. It just didn't. And all in all, I'm awful glad to be out of it. Because I don't think we did a whole lot of good. We sure tried. Hello, friend. That is indeed. How are you? Hey, buddy boy. Yeah, it's good to see you. It's good to have you here, fella. Yeah, you betcha. Jesus. Are you, are you still a Republican? <laughs> yeah, or about half. Sorry, oh, buddy. Please. I don't care, Sasha. My love, I really don't care. Hey, right there, right. right there. That's okay. That's fine. Okay. Zingo, zingo, zango. Okay. Okay. And here's a nitrogen. Okay. Obviously, CH double bond C CH three. Ah, NH2. come on. No, I can do that way, but let's see. What do you mean, so long? Uh. Hey, whoops! I can't do it. There you are. You complete it. <laughs> How many years now have you been friends? Oh my God. Since 1969. <laughs> wow. You may be right. Yep, 1969. Why does that not surprise me? The, the Pepper That's Committee right. hearings. That's oh, right. Yeah. Oh, oh God, in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. 17th floor, federal building. Yep. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. It's wonderful. We've uh, gone up to like a, pl a plus one. Wow. And okay. it's very. It was. It was that conference, I think, where we got our picture taken together. Yes. And it ended up in high times. I don't know what you guys. Oh, oh my yeah. God! It's a nice That's picture of the two of us. They identified me as Dr. Chauvin, the inventor of the DMA. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, wait, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> with an unidentified asshole. <laughs> yeah, it was great Sunday afternoons. But my job's keep the fireplace going, and to make runs up and down to the magic storeroom where we have chemicals stored. I'm pretty good. I think I can. As long as I didn't get paid, it was okay to, to work in his lab. Oh, that's the cord. He was able to uh, 
get us standards for new drugs that are out on the street before we could get them from headquarters. She did all kinds of stuff for us. Uh, we, we gave him an award for his assistance. I began. I thought I had lead sulfate. More tin, more zinc. Ah, lead oxide. That'll work, okay. won't it? Now he's my brother. Maybe we were brothers in a previous life. Who knows? <laughs> whoopee, whoopee, whoopee. <laughs> oh, here, here he comes. Yeah, come on out in the sun, babe. Yeah, so we're supposed to play for a hog roast next Saturday. We're going to cross the street again. No, it's red light, red light, red light. No walkie, no walkie. I was telling somebody a story about the time I came to visit you and you had figured out this formula for solving the Rubik's Cube. Oh, yeah. I said, we used to get together once or maybe twice a year at a meeting or something. It's always fun. It's nice to, uh, when you can talk to somebody who sort of understands your language, you know, what you're talking about. Sasha's basically retired. He's trying to write up his final book. I take the print out. I can't even read that anymore now. Oh, that's terrible. You know, secretly, down, down secretly, I wish there were a drug we could find that could, someone could take it and they could go, do you realize how fucked up you are in your thinking? You know, do you realize what you've done? You know, what we as the most advanced civilization in the world, what have we done? We landed on a moon, but uh, other than that, I mean, we have the best weapons, we have the best, you know, stealth, missiles, the best stealth bombers, the, you know, the best machine guns, the best laser guided missiles. I mean, is that something to be proud of? You know, I don't think so. I'll try to pick up a few hints and get better. So when I retire, I can play with a band and some blues band and say, here's Dr. Dave on the harp. Used to be the world's LSD expert and now he plays blues harp for us. the sort of existential questions that people have. Um, I am just not sure that science is what you want, but I don't take these drugs. I haven't had one of these experiences before. And if someone who had were to sort of argue that, you know, that's missing the core of the experience, I would say, okay, you know, that I accept that, you know, fill it in for me, you know, what do you got? Those little pills are terrible. Okay, Mr. Red, come on. That's like totally an amazing sight. His handwritten, you know, drawn molecules on bottles and stuff like that. It's way cool. I think it's just art. He does it so beautifully. His notebooks are filled with this, with these. Uh, he calls them dirty pictures. <laughs> and when you consider that each one of those is probably weeks to months of work, I mean, in the some hundreds of compounds that he's uh, synthesized and tested. When I first started doing serious work here, you know, Sasha hadn't been working, it had been invaded by uh, local critters, but his uh, vision and his intuition are still uh, very lively. I'm sure I could not keep up with all the things that he would like to make 
uh, but I'm, I'm gradually uh, getting a little better, and uh, uh, there's, there's a long way to go. Okay, so now it's down to 50 degrees even. So you're in IPA at 50 degrees? Yes. Good enough, sounds good. Okay, and we got uh, a little over one and a half grams of total cleaned 5-methoxy nalt out of that. I had methyl you'd have malt, wouldn't you? Right, methyl allyl tryptamine. So we don't have methyl yet? Nope. So this is really mono allyl tryptamine. Right. So you start calling it malt, then you're into, into uh, then you're into ambiguity. Ambiguity, right. And Lord knows, we've got all the ambiguity we can have. We all can possibly want, yes. <laughs> I did not have a goal. I still don't have a goal. What I'm looking for is learning from the process. What's the goal of a, oh, I can't think of a good analogy. And uh, it's, it's like an explorer. You know, where there's a hill in front of him that, mm -hmm. that he's never seen before. A hallway filled with closed doors. Go through them and you find another hallway with more doors. It's an absolutely marvelous continuous process of discovery. Maybe the mind does continue, and the soul does continue, when we, the observers, over the normal clock, see the brain stops. That doesn't, 